Radio Live. Superpowers. Okay, we're here with Jordana <laughs> Guaymarais, co-founder and PR director of Fashion Ovation. Jordana, what's up? How are you guys? Thank you for having me on the line today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, are you in Brazil these days or in uh, New York? I know you're on that line all the time. Yeah, I'm actually in New York right now. My base. Awesome. Awesome. So what is Fashion Innovation? So Fashion Innovation is an event and a multimedia platform where we bridge the gap in conversation between the fashion industry, the technology industry, and we bring an entrepreneurial mindset to everybody who's involved. So we usually have the VP, CEOs, or founders of both companies that have been around for decades, as well as the startups that are innovating together on different panels, which really they discuss various topics that intersect in both these industries. So we have sustainability, women empowerment, entrepreneurship, e-commerce, manufacturing, production, um, and it's just a ton of knowledge and people that normally wouldn't mix. We put them together to converse and create new relationships and see where it goes. So it's a bit like uh, if I'm looking at other sort of references like TED uh, for the fashion industry. Yeah. So if you take TED Talk, Tech Crunch, Business of Fashion, mix it up and then sprinkle in a little millennial sauce, you have exactly what fashion innovation is. Cool. So like what's hip these days? A lot is that a word no, or did I just sound like sexy? I was, I was ashamed right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm just, sorry. I'm sorry. Actually like it, it's like I, I already just killed itself. No, I was, I was, I was ashamed and, and I, 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 I wanted to leave. But, but I was Please just, stay. <laughs> stay. Jordana, too. You too. So what's hip these days? <laughs> what are the youngsters like? So we, um, there's a lot of new things that we're seeing. So there are two things. One, NASA is actually a lot of the textiles that are used nowadays by designers are NASA inspired. So you have uh, wrinkle free and all of that type of stuff. It all comes from materials that NASA has been using for hundreds of years, um, which are now being used for everyday wear, which is really cool. Um, and then another thing that we see is um, a lot of brands collect collaborating with technology companies. So Levi's and Google just collaborated and they created a jean jacket called the Google Jack Card Jacket. And what it does, it's a commuter jacket so that everything that happens on your phone translates to your jean jacket. So when you're on the go, but you can't be, it's a type of job where you can't wait to know if you have an email that popped in, you have to see everything as it comes in. If you get an email or a text message or a call, your jacket vibrates and lights up in different areas depending on how you program it on an app that comes with the jacket when you make the purchase. So things like that are happening now more and more where it's not only hip, as you said, but <laughs> it's also um, just very useful for the world that we're living in nowadays where we're always having to be connected. Amazing. And, and wait, okay, so let's talk about NASA for a second. By the way, I yeah. had a theory not long ago. Maybe you know about this theory and, and more than I do. I, I heard that Velcro was actually uh, uh, invented in NASA, right? Yeah, yep, 100%. Yep. So, oh, it's true. So they didn't yeah, lie. It is okay. true. Yeah. So, like, why would I need inspiration from NASA? Because I'm not going to be in Mars in the next while. I hope not. <laughs> but, but, like, why would right. I need, well, what's interesting in their innovation? What, what's good in wearables? So, the thing is, like, okay, so let's say nowadays everybody's always on the go. Everybody wants to do a million things at the same time. It's not often that you're going to wash clothing and then take out an ironing board and have time to iron every piece of clothing that you wash. At least I don't. I, I'm always wrinkled. So, so let's say like, you know, for men, especially that are not, you know, very, I mean, I'm not going to generalize, but most men are not very like homemaker types. So you, let's say you have a suit that you want to wear, but you ha always have to get a dry clean and all of that. There's a designer now by the name of Ministry of Supply. And what he does is he created, he took NASA inspired uh, textiles where you can have a full suit for men, where you wear the suit, it gets dirty, you throw it in a washing machine, and then you take that suit, the entire suit, and you throw it in a drying machine. You take it out, you don't have to, it's wrinkle-free, it comes out as if though you never washed it and never threw it in a machine to dry. It's 
amazing. So Wait, things what? like that. Does it look good too? It looks amazing. <laughs> it looks amazing. And it's cheap. It's not expensive compared to other suits. So it's like inexpensive. You can have various colors. You'd never have to take it to the dry cleaner. Of course, you're always going to have brands that use better fabric where maybe it's more high end. But when it comes to an everyday suit that looks good, if you wear, I always say if you wear something well, it's always going to look good. It doesn't have to be a major brand. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars. It's all about how you wear it. That's my philosophy, at least. So I think, yeah, it's amazing. So a lot of things like that is actually coming from NASA. That's amazing. And okay, so another question. How is someone solving the wrinkly situation? Because like ironing is like a really... Um, it, it, it's like that in umbrellas, they haven't progressed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What, what's going on? Like, there has to be a solution of something getting wrinkly and straight. Yeah. So, that's exactly what NASA is doing. So, what they use for their textiles when it comes to the suits that astronauts use and all of that. They're all wrinkle free. So they're using these textiles that are being used by NASA for hundreds of years. And now they're adapting them to everyday wear. And many brands are doing that so that it, that it is so does important that astronauts free. don't have like their suit cannot be wrinkled. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> that does not look good. National, like and millions of people if are here, okay? If that alien meeting yeah. happens and he's wrinkled, you know. What a shame. You know, shame on shame. you, astronaut. You represent. How can you take their selfies? It's true. And, okay. And, and okay. And I have another question. There's a lot of doubts about, uh, you know, all the um, fashion tech. So everything has to do with the mobile phone. Isn't there anything like that, that has to not do with the mobile phone? Like. Maybe it's not the emails, but I don't know. For sure, yeah. So I think when you say fashion tech, a lot of people have this impression that it has to be something like mobile or email or Google. And it's not necessarily, I always tell people, especially putting these events together, but because there's a lot of companies that have a lot of great innovation behind what they do, but it's not necessarily technology like physical technology. So what we saw, for example, there's a brand they're based out of, I believe it's Spain. Don't quote me on the place, but I will tell you about the brand. Um, it's called Constanza plus lab and what they do is they have clothing that have led lighting that is installed in the clothes so when you're wearing let's say a dress right and you have like a white dress and it has a silver stripe going down the middle beautiful clothing you go into a place you turn the lights off at a nightclub or a lounge or wherever and that silver stripe becomes different colors throughout the night through led lighting that's installed in the fabric of the collection which is beautiful it sounds totally nutty but it's super cool so that's something that's very fashion you watch that? that i don't know <laughs> but i do know it's very cool um another thing that is really cool i think in fashion tech is augmented reality and ai which is done a lot nowadays as well so you have companies such as Perfect Corp. You have one that I can't even mention because they're brand new and they're going to be showcasing for the very first time at our event in February. But what they're doing is you're able to go onto any website. You're able to click on a piece of clothing that you want to buy e-commerce. You're able to create a, a virtual reality person of yourself on your computer and you can try clothes on before it arrives to your house using augmented reality. It's amazing. So you never have to like have something come to your house, try it on, see that it doesn't fit and return it. You can do everything via like being on your computer and trying clothes on via like a person that you create with your exact measurements through these companies that are making augmented reality possible. So it's really insane. It's amazing. There's like that, 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 that like, um, that's a long race since minority report. I think that's one of the inventions that are, all right, you know, I've been hearing that for a long time now. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. So we have a few companies that are doing that for beauty, for fashion, for different sectors. And it's just really cool to see where everything is headed. Everything, really, if you look at everything at the end of the day, you even have, you know, we do a lot of sustainability stuff. And there are brands now that every piece of um, whatever you buy on e-commerce for these brands, not only do you get, let's say you buy a t-shirt, you get a t-shirt in the mail, but it comes with a letter stating the name of the person that created your shirt, their story, where they're from, their history. So you know exactly where it comes from so that there's no like hidden, you know, 
Was it made in a factory where they like mistreat the employees? You know, everything about the person who's behind the brand. So I think nowadays two things are very common. One is the technology. But another thing, people are looking to buy things. They, they want to feel a personal connection to their purchase. And that we're finding more and more in brands such as Crochet Kids, Known Supply, Away to Mars. There's so many companies doing that type of stuff. And it's really cool. And Jordana, so basically your venture is sort of the intersection between uh, the voices uh, of the ideas uh, and the executors. And yeah. so I'm trying to understand what's the business model like? What's your involvement with the, those actual ideas? So what we do is we pretty much do a lot of research. We have a team that is like around the clock researching and who's the new, who's the latest, who's doing what. And then what we do is we start to contact these individuals that are doing these things. And we start to see, okay, Louis Vuitton, they do this for for ages. They should be speaking to someone who does this because this could better their business model. Now, when we put them together in a panel, we really just put them together because it'll be the first time that probably they'll be speaking because normally they don't converse or mix. And then we put them together with already the mission in mind of what could come out of this conversation. And so we're kind of like the... We're kind of like consultants without them hiring us to consult through putting them in these conversations that will allow them to create new relationships and be able to bring these new innovations to their companies risk-free because they're learning about it through a conversation that's very organic. So we end up becoming like the middleman between these people meeting and connecting for the first time. And then also we... You know, putting these events together, we end up, what we're really trying to do is build a community of like-minded individuals, of people that want to learn more about everything that I just told you guys that's happening in fashion tech. And I think a lot of people, when you go to them and say, what is fashion tech? A lot of people don't know, or they know it exists, but they don't know what exactly is it. And so I think there was a niche for this when we put Fashion Innovation together. And just through the responses being so positive from these huge people that are coming on board to speak, just through a cold email and just the concept and the idea is when we looked at each other, myself and my husband, who's my partner, and we're like, wow, we have something here that's bigger than just an event because this is something that has been lacking because of the response so proactive that we're getting from people. And you're doing this pro bono? So we, the business model, the events that we do, we bring on sponsors, but the sponsors that sponsor the event, they're not just sponsoring for their benefit. We actually bring them in a way that's like beneficial to us because all of the sponsors have things that are innovation and technology oriented and in fashion that people don't know exist. So we're bringing it to the forefront and they pay us to sponsor and be a part of the event and be able to interact with these people that they wouldn't normally interact with as well as have an audience of 500 people attending. Um, and then another thing we do is we sell tickets to the event, but a lot of that has to go back to the venue and, you know, putting an event together is very expensive. Um, but I think through ticket sales, sponsorships, and then eventually when the multimedia platform is up, we're going to have a subscription base so that the same thing they do with Business of Fashion, WWD, but it's all fashion tech. So we really want to be the number one fashion tech reference worldwide, both in the multimedia platform as well as the events, which eventually we want to take all over the world. Wow. So you're very much after the impact. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. (laughs) <laughs> how did you get to doing this? So I've been in public relations for the last 15 years, really freelance for like new designers, new brands, um, a lot of marketing also coming up with new ideas, but mostly in fashion entertainment. My husband has been in the entrepreneurial ecosystem his entire life through a company called Endeavor. It's a very known company. It's a not-for-profit for businesses that want to scale. And most of these businesses have innovation, so entrepreneurship innovation. And we met three and a half years ago. So on a personal note, met in Brazil, fell in love, had two babies, moved to New York, mm-hmm. that whole craziness. And um, he wanted to do something in New York coming from Brazil and you know being new in New York. He wanted to do a TED Talk type event where it would only be about entrepreneurship. But then he saw there were so many of these and he's like, I want to do something that makes me stand out. So then he comes to me and he says, you've been doing this in fashion for your entire life practically. Would it make sense for me to bring in the entrepreneurs, but as bring in the fashion? I'm like, for sure. He's like, would it make sense if we brought innovation and technology into it? And I'm like, definitely. And then we literally sat down. It was 
end of July of this past year, 2018. And we put a piece of paper and a pen and we're like, fashion, innovation, technology, fashion, technology, fashion, innovation. Okay, we got the name. And from August to September. So in a month, not even, and so a month and a half, we put the entire first event together um, from the speakers to the venue to everybody who was in attendance. It was insane. And we were able to make a really successful first event. So that's when we realized that we had a lot more than just an event in our hands and we really had a business and that's how it came about and then is this something that you do part-time at the moment or did you guys just sort of jump all in yeah so I literally 15 years of what I was doing I closed out everything that I had going on with PR and marketing and I decided to literally just dive in and give my 100% full time. I believe in life. If you don't dedicate, you can't do too many things at once. I think you can, but I don't think any of them will ever be at its 100% potential. I think until you give something 100%, that's when magic happens. And so I really wanted to do that with fashion innovation. And then I do a lot of philanthropy work on the side, but that's not like my job. That's just my hobby and my passion. And you still have um, time for that. I, well, I have one project that I do. I actually, I'm launching a book in February at our event. I just published my first book. Wow, congratulations. All, thank you. <laughs> So the name of the book is It Can Be You, and it's to give a face to homelessness, to humanize homelessness. So what I did is I gathered um, 50 influencers from all over the world that shared stories of struggles in their life. And then I was able to raise $10,000 on GoFundMe and give meals to homeless in Manhattan. And so I took stories from these homeless individuals that I would give meals to and how they wound up homeless. And I just published a book now where... I have the story of an influencer and then underneath that story, I have the story of someone who's homeless today and showing people how just because of a circumstance, that's what differentiates the two. And then the name of the book is It Can Be You and I'll be launching it for the first time at the event. Nice. Wow. Good luck with that. that Great idea. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like the influencers are ones that you knew before or through your PR work or... It was really you know, the- through reaching out about the project like you know two years ago is when I said I want to do this and I put together a launch for it and I was very lucky to get people such as Christina Milian and Jay Wow from Jersey Shore and a ton of huge people really again a very diverse group um, and we really made a lot of noise and I was able to like thankfully get a lot of press for wanting to give back to homelessness and then just reaching out to influencers and saying, I have this idea, I have this book. Do you want to be part of it? And it was very same thing that happened with fashion innovation is was that's when I felt the universe was, this was my calling to really give back and be able to just humanize the situation. Cause I think homelessness is so sad. And so all the proceeds of the book sales, when it's launched now, I'm going to give back to five, different homeless organizations in LA, Miami, New York, and Brazil. Um, And then eventually just do more with that project. But yeah, so that's a big part of who I am is just giving back as well. Wow. And like, I'm I'm curious, those homeless people that uh, you put under that radar, are they still homeless? Because I always think that once some circumstances, some people uh, get get the specific attention, then they sort of maybe make a difference or get the help that they need. Yeah. So I do have the locations of where I met them um, written down and I have all of that. And when I pass by, a lot of them I've become friends with and I see them. The thing is that it's hard to be the type of person that says, I'm going to you know, give awareness. I'm going to give back. I'm going to put them in a home. I'm going to give them a job. I have to be realistic, especially when you have a family with two babies and you have to provide. I can't do all of that. Yeah. And you're an entrepreneur with a startup. Yeah. (laughs) So I just thought to myself, I said, you know what? I think there are already agencies that give, you know, the support or agencies that give shelter and all of that. I said, but no one is really just trying to give awareness to why the issue is there. And I think that a lot of people, when they look at someone who's homeless, the first thing that comes to mind is they can get up and get a job. Oh, they must want to buy alcohol or it must be drugs. It's always those three like things that people have like a stigma, which normally is not the case. So I felt like I really wanted to spread awareness of other stories so that people start to be more compassionate. And I think through people being more compassionate, eventually maybe there is a solution to people wanting 
to help more and then more people being off to the streets. So I'm like, let me just take a portion, which is the humanizing and the giving the stories. And then I'll allow the companies that have already been doing the support part of it. I'll give them the money so that they can reach out to more people and help more people. So that was my thought behind it. Love it. Thank you. And let's go back a little bit. Uh, so yeah. How did you end up in the fashion industry in the first place? Or, or was it PR that evolved into fashion? Yeah, so that's another crazy story. All my stories are crazy now that I'm sorry. So PR, I actually, I'm kind of a, I don't know what to call myself, but I would say a wild spirit. So I, I never really, not that I didn't like school, but I didn't like the formality of school. I don't like people telling you when to read, when to memorize, when to do. Like, I just never liked that till today. I don't like it. Um, and so school was never really my thing. So when I graduated high school, I decided not to go to college and I just dove into working. I had every job imaginable. I was a teller at a bank. I did payroll at different hospitals. I worked at Blockbuster Video. I was the manager at Cole Haan. I was even a real estate agent. So it was insane. And every job I had, I would end up getting to a point where I would be congratulated for my work and I would move on to the next. So I was always very bored. So one day, 23 years old, I said, I have to find something that I'm going to stick to. So I went to Barnes & Noble. I bought an encyclopedia that had every job imaginable. I found public relations. I read the page about it, and I said, "Sir, did this you is look what I meant to do." Did you public relations, or did you just no, stumble? No, I just it? I just scrolled through. I was like, "Nope, nope, nope, nope." PR read it, and I said, "This is it." So then I went home, and I went on Craigslist, and I looked up PR jobs, not even really knowing what it was, just reading a page about it, and I found a job that was a really exclusive job to be the PR director for Nina Ricci, Porsche Design, some really huge brands. And when I read this, you know, ad, I was like, this is what I'm meant to do. So I wrote an email to the president of the company and I was like, you know, my name is Jordana. I just read, I, oh, and I bought PR for dummies. So I was like, I just read <laughs> PR for dummies. This is what I know I can do. If you give me the opportunity, I'd love to take the job. The man replies and he says, you have a lot of balls to apply for a position like this, but I would love to meet you just to see who you are because I've never gotten an email like this in my life. So I went, we met. And after talking for about an hour, he looked at me and he said, I'll never forget this. But he said, he said, you can learn anything by reading books, but passion comes from within. And when you talk about wanting to do this, I see the passion and the fire behind your eyes. So he said, I'm going to give you the job. I'm not going to pay you. You're going to work for three months for free. And I'm not even going to tell you what to do or how to do it. If you can prove to me that this is really what you want to do, then we'll talk after three months. I said, okay, I'll take it. So I took the position and I started working and I would Google everything. So he would say, write a press release. I would Google press release and step by step and, you know, all of that. Three months later, I was able to get them into a ton of publications. We went to Vegas for a trade show. He offered me the job. He said, I'm going to start paying you. I'm so amazed, blah, blah, blah. And the minute he offered me the job, something clicked in my head. And I said, wait, if I could do this for them, why not open my own public relations agency or do my right. own thing? So I literally just, I told him, no, thank you. And I started my own company and I was 23 and a half at the time. And I've never looked back since, always worked for myself. So that's my story. It's kind of crazy. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah. There's so Whoa. many holes in this story. But for, <laughs> like, I'm going to start with the basics. First of all, did you buy the book or sit in Barnes & Noble and read actually every I Every no, job <laughs> ever. That I bought the book. I bought PR for that reason. So you read every, every, like everything that there, every job ever. Yeah, I read. What book is this? Much, Do you remember the name? I'm so. I don't remember. It was like every job. It was like. It was something like, it wasn't even an encyclopedia. That's not the right word. But it was just a really thick book of careers, like different things that you could okay. do. Okay. And then when you got to the public relations page, what was the sentence or what was the idea that you said, okay, I want to do this? People. All I remember was people, communication, people, relationships. I was like, this is me. I've always loved people. I have a thing where I'm like excited by people's stories. So I was like, this is what I meant to do. Okay. And then when you said, uh, you know, and then you went through Craigslist and then you saw that yeah. job. No, wait, but before that, she bought that uh, PR for dummies. PR for dummies. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. But she decided, okay, fair enough. And, and, then, and then you sent that to the president. By the way, how'd you find his email, LinkedIn? 
So it's the same way that I found everybody at Fashion Innovation. And so everybody who's participated so far has all been just through research online, LinkedIn, and just different processes to get to the right person. But I've always been, people usually hate cold calling. I love it. Like for me, it's like a game, like getting the right person and getting them on the phone and getting them interested. So that's what I did. When I found a job, I knew the name of the company. I went online. I Googled his name. I found the name. And it was a company... So I can even tell you the name of the company. It's Spector Corporation. They held the licenses to these brands. And so what I did is I, because it wasn't a huge company, but it was a company like decently sized, they usually had, you know, they have email sometimes on the website. So I found the name and the email of the president and I emailed him directly. Exactly. Okay. So then you emailed him and then he replied. No. He replied. And I remember the sentence, you have a lot of balls to be applying for a position like this, considering that you know sure. nothing about it. Yeah. And okay, so so yeah, this is really interesting for me. Okay, you went through all these jobs, right? Okay, so yeah. you're swimming through all these jobs. You you have a knack of getting to the right person and also getting the job. How do you do that? Like, you should so, be the best yeah. person in the world also for cold calling and also <laughs> for, for getting a job interview, right? It's true, because now that I'm thinking about it, who does payroll at a, five hospitals in New York, the biggest ones in Long Island, without getting a college degree? That's a really good question. Um, I honestly, even a Cole Haan being a manager and all of that type of stuff and never being, never having worked in retail. So now that you asked me that question, I've never thought about that in that way. Um, but I think it's just, you know what? I'm going to say this. I read people really well. I know this is the thing that I think most people have to know. Everybody that you talk to has a certain energy and a certain something about them. If you can adapt to their energy and recreate it into your own, and you can have a conversation with them where they feel like you understand them just because of the way that you're, you, you, you can't speak to everybody in the same way. Like you have to adapt their energy into yours and you have to just have a little bit of knowledge about what it is that they do so that you can incorporate it into what you're saying so that the person can say, okay, this person can do the job. And then once you get the job, even if you don't know how to do it a hundred percent, you can learn along the way because there's knowledge, there's knowledge to be learned everywhere, Google books, you know what I mean? So at the end of the day, all the stuff that people find to be like extremely difficult, if you just put like a personal like touch and just humanize the situation. I'm going to go back to that. You were at humanizing. I think that that's the trick to everything that I've done now that I'm looking back at it is just really learning like people and just kind of having a little bit of psychology, like manifested into it. It sounds like you're <laughs> sort of gamified life. Like she's looking at stuff and everything is like, Oh cool. That's a challenge. Let's see how I hack my way <laughs> through this. Where's the guidebook for dummies for that vertical? No, it's funny because, <laughs> because no, because it's not. It's, it's kind of funny because you, you're talking about public relations, but I think you said it the best when w without saying it because you read you, when I asked you what sentences you saw there. So you talked about three words. It was people, relationships, and communication, right? Yeah. That has exactly. nothing to do with public <laughs> relations, right? But what's, <laughs> what, what's cool about it is, is actually that those are your attributes, right? Because yeah. you sound like you're a person that knows how to build relationships. You're very yeah. good with communications, right? Fearless. The, like the, the criteria of public relations uh, it, it has nothing to do with what... You just you're, you're just very likable. I have a question. Does that bother you sometimes? Like, does aggressive? Like, do you have any aggressive yeah. as a businesswoman now? Are you aggressive yeah. at all? Do people? Is there any person in the world that hates you? So I'm sure there is, right? Everybody. I mean, maybe not like directly, but I'm sure people. Not everybody likes everybody, but I will tell you this. I think. I, that's the one thing that I lack sometimes, but the thing is this, I'm not aggressive, but I'm very persistent. I'm persistent to a point and I've gotten this a lot. People call me pleasantly aggressive. And I've had people tell me that if I was to push a little bit more than I do, they would be like, leave me alone. Don't ever call me again. But I go to that point where I'm right at the edge and I don't cross <laughs> that line. So I'm, <laughs> I'm extremely persistent. And so that in a way I'm aggressive, but I know where to stop. But I go to a point where I'm like at there, like I can't go any further. Um, until I get what I want. So, so let's, let's maybe break that down. So, you know, I think a lot of people, if they're trying to get their dream job uh, yeah. or to make their dream in general, dream venture happen, 
uh, they're yeah. sort of struggling with how to get the right uh, to the right people and how to yeah. sort of ground their idea and make it happen. So what tips would you give them? Like how, how do you go about actually trying to get to a certain person and getting them to listen and getting them on board yeah. what you want? So I think the one thing that I've done a lot recently, which really helped is go to events where I know that these people will be. There's so many events that like take place, especially when it comes to business. If you do the right research, you'll find like dozens a day. You can't even go to all of them. Um, and I think like when you go to like Google and you Google a person's name, whoever that may be, that is maybe a boss you want to work for or the founder of a company you want to work for. Um, you can usually find on photos, like places that these people are events in particular, because every event has a lot of press after. So you see the post coverage. So even if it takes you six months or most events are once a year, going to that event, knowing that they'll be there, making it a point to go up to them, tell them that, you know, their time is super valuable, but you need two seconds of their time. And you just say one thing that, you know, will spark their interest based on what they do and what you want to do with them. And always tell like, when you say that one sentence, because normally it's a very quick conversation, never talk about you. Always talk about what you think they want to listen that will like better what they're doing. And then as soon as you catch their interest, you they'll usually tell you, here's my email. I can't really talk right now, but let's continue conversation. Or here's my phone number. If you're really lucky, some people do, some people don't, depending on how big they are. Um, and then having that just, if you are afraid to ask, you're never going to get a yes. And I think that's the biggest like misconception that people have. People are always like, like I remember I took a course at Dartmouth recently, which is an Ivy League here in, in the US. And um, there was a mentor there who's a self-made billionaire. And after the course was over, I went up to him and I said, I would love someone like you to mentor me. This was two years ago. And he was like, here's my email address. I can help you. All right, you didn't tell him anything about what's in it for him though. I didn't. I didn't because that that's a, that's a different thing. But what I'm saying with that is asking like, I I asked him for his email. He gave it to me and I knew that I couldn't do anything for him because he works with like, um, things like, uh, what is it? Like, um, uh, like architectural design for like street, like, uh, building and things like that. Totally different from my area, but I knew that he could help me in a business sense. So then he gave me his email address and a year later I went back to Dartmouth and for the full year he mentored me. And when I went back, we were talking about mentors and I said, Oh, so-and-so is my mentor and has been helping me for the past year. And my colleague was like, how did you get him to do that? And I was like, I asked and he said, yes. So I think like, I think the, yeah, I think for me, that's the biggest misconception that people have is people being afraid of the no. And so they don't say anything or they don't ask. Um, and I also think if you have someone's email or phone number and they're not responding, busy people, if they see your email once, twice, three times, they're not going to respond because they have a million emails. But if every morning you copy paste and send that <laughs> same message until you get an answer, I promise you they will respond promise there's no way they won't because they'll be there every day and finally they'll be like oh let me just get this out of the way because this person is annoying wait copy yeah. pasting the same message that's that's a, same message. Heard that strategy same, before. same message i did that recently with a man and probably shouldn't name him but he has like billions of dollars for like um philanthropy causes and launching my book i was like i really want to hear his advice i texted him every day for i think three weeks. My husband was laughing. Like, he's like, you're crazy. And three weeks later, let me just give me one second. Cause I'm going to read exact. Oh, he said, I love your tenacity. This is what he responded. I love your tenacity. Are you available to speak in 10 minutes? I was like, yes, <laughs> we got on the phone after three weeks of sending him the same message every day. And then he's talked to me for like 30 minutes and gave me the best advice. And then I went on with my day. So yeah, just through experience is what I'm telling you. But I think those are my, what's worked for me, at least. Let's talk about not being scared of failing because you're doing tons of jobs that you have no idea how to do, right? Yeah. So like, Well, now I do because what, I've been doing it for 15 years. But in the beginning, I didn't. No, but even what you're doing now, you haven't written a book before. Oh, no, no, that's true. That's true. These are like not trivial things. Most people um, are scared of failing. I don't know all the, you know, they have to structure the exact idea of what they're going to do tomorrow and how they're yeah. going to do it. Like, mm -hmm. is, is that something like how, how 
The thing is, everybody fails, right? All the time. I'm failing now all the time, even doing what I'm doing. I'm always making mistakes, always. Every time I'm like, I think I got it now. Nope, there comes <laughs> another mistake. So <laughs> I think like once you come to the realization, even, I mean, I have two babies, right? I have an 11 month old and a two year old. I make mistakes all the time as a mom. Like it's, it's just, it's the part of life. Like you're always going to make errors. And I think once you come to that realization, you're like, okay, I mean, damned if I do, damned if I don't. Like if you don't try, how are you ever going to know? And if you fail, you're amongst a million other people who fail on a daily. So it's like, it's just, I think people have to stop being afraid of that because failure is a part of life. And it's also how you learn, how you grow and how, and the more, if you fail, that shows like authenticity to who you are. I've never met a successful entrepreneur that said, I did it and I got it right the first time and I became a millionaire. Never. And I kept the money since. Like, I've never heard that story. Um, and so I think it's just a part of like, you know, living. And that's kind of how I go about it, really. And then like, is this the sum of uh, a game of numbers? So I'm guessing if you're persistent in the sort of cold emailing a lot yeah. of people, even if, even if yeah. it's people who you got their email or phone through... Yeah. Uh, an event, I'm sure yeah. still a lot of them are just being polite and waving you off. Um, yeah. And then yeah, you probably sure. like email these people. And I mean, A, it must be like that you have some sort of daily routine where you start your morning with your uh, chasing session. Yeah. And then yeah, B, exactly. it has to be, I don't know, like from the numbers that I know, it has to be like if you get 10% response, a 10% response rate, that's huge. Yeah, exactly. So, It's a numbers game for sure. But I also think like, So this is my spiritual side. I'm really spiritual and I believe a lot in like universe, like making things happen when it, they're supposed to. Um, so I think like for, let's say PR, when I did it for 15 years and I was looking for clients, it was a numbers game big time. Like I had to email a thousand people to get maybe 10 clients. So that for sure. Um, but then I think, and this is what's been so ironic with Fashion Ovation and the Nylon Project, which is what the book is under. I think, When I started doing both of them, it was like, I don't know, 70% positive response out of 100 emails. Like it was insane. And that's when, like I said, you know, I think this is meant to be happening because things don't happen this easily. So I think sometimes you'll go through life with a numbers game method. But I think once you're doing exactly what you're meant to do, and again, this is totally on a spiritual level, I think that's when the universe manifests itself and it becomes more of just doing the right thing at the right time and people responding a lot more than being a numbers game. But you're most definitely right. Most times it's a numbers I game. I relate to what you're saying completely, yeah. uh, but I will also add this. A, I think, um, because I'm also relating to what you're saying, but I think yeah. A, once there's that uh, facial report that you generate, yeah. then I do believe that actually most people aren't really waving you off. And even if they're yeah. sort of waving off, they still probably yeah. have a pretty good impression. Uh, and then yeah. the email sort of sealed the deal uh, rather yeah. than people just giving you an email and planning on not to answer, which is probably yeah. actually the lower percentage. Yeah. Uh, sure. And then I think besides this being spiritual, it's also just, you know, you actually connecting. Because, yeah. because yeah. I, I, I mean, I'll tell you this much. If you were throwing this out to the universe, but just cold emailing, no matter how cosmic this is, yeah. you'd probably yeah. still have a much lower success rate. Yeah. And authentically really loving what you do. I think people feel it. It's like when you sell something that you don't really like, you're like, oh, this shirt yeah. is beautiful, but you don't like it. People, I think it's like really loving what you do. goes a lot further I think you really have to like what you do or at least have an interest in what you do because I think if you just do something to do it I think that lowers your chances when, when it comes to that stuff but how do you find something that you love how to do that's like most people don't find that yeah you know I think for me when I go in the shower <laughs> But it's true. When I go in the shower and the water turns on, it's the weirdest thing. Like this nylon project, the book that's coming out, came about in the shower. I literally was in the shower one day and then I was like, homeless, influencers, hashtag it can be you. Like it all came to me in this one shower. And every time for me, the shower is the only time, is the only place where my mind shuts off ever. Because that's I'm actually almost... scientifically proven, Jordana. Do you know that? Oh, is it? 
I yeah, didn't know that. It's the same with the meditating. It's sort of uh, cha- your uh, your brain waves. About, uh, about Charles Brian, Brian Halligan, Halligan yeah. right? Brian Halligan, the, Hubs- the uh, founder of HubSpot and their CEO. Uh, he that's also told us uh, that he gets his ideas in the shower. Uh, oh, that's and, so interesting. And it, but, uh, it's, but it's not so, just him. It's, it's proven because uh, once your brain waves slow down, and I can't remember if it's the alpha or beta waves, then you're sort of open a gateway to your subconscious. And then a lot That's of things so flow into your head that because the noise quietens down and it's not, this isn't spiritual talk. This is scientifically proven. That's so, amazing. But, yeah. So it's about, it's a matter of being relaxed and just letting your, your but, flow but, of thought. S- sorry, just one question. You showered <laughs> and you said homeless. <laughs> like that was, the, that was the first word. Was it, was it that? <laughs> no, it was showering and going, giving back. And then thinking about my childhood in Brazil and then saying homeless. Because that, yeah, that, that would be the equivalent of just opening up the shower and saying pickles. <laughs> it's, a, it's a straight up thought. It's random. That's true. <laughs> okay. So I'm wondering something. So what, what would you see in the future? Like what, where, where are you in a year? So in a year, I would like to, I, I set like not too many goals because every time I set too many things like New Year's resolutions, let's say it's you, I think you have to go little by little. So I think in a year, I would like to have my book out, um, possibly on Amazon and like internationally spoken about so that it starts to really make a difference and I can give back enough money to make a difference in enough lives. That's in the philanthropy side. On the business side, um, I would like to have this February now, next month, this event be really, really great and then do another event in September also really, really great to really build the brand. So like, I think once we have two more events that are successful under our belt, then we can eventually take it to other countries. So that's the first goal. And then the second goal is for Fashion Ovation by the end of the year to start taking subscriptions because we're going to start with premiums and just have people go in and just see that we're really good at the knowledge that we're sharing and then be able to, by the end of the year, start the subscription base on the multimedia platform that we're building. So I think on the business and philanthropy side, those would be my goals by the end of 2019, which I think it's enough. I think it's a lot. I'm just throwing another idea out there and sorry if I'm out of line, but I think those uh, connections that you're making between different businesses got to yeah. be worth something uh, to everyone. So it would be sort of a win-win if you could somehow tap into how you could become some part of those businesses that could also be amazing. I think that's an amazing idea, but I think it's too much for one year. I don't know, maybe not, but like the consulting thing, I think eventually, because even now people are, now that they know fashion innovation, people are coming and saying, oh, I need a company that does this. And right off the top of my head, because of the speakers we have, there are companies that I learned of. That's that's your business proposition. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's your business. That's what you offer in fashion. You're offering the, 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 the connection between people. Like That's true. Yeah. so it should, like, there's no problem of giving it for free because that's your superpower. That's actually yeah. a really good retirement uh, offer. After you finish doing the fashion innovation, you could probably be a great consultant as well. Yeah. Okay. I'll put it in my notes. <laughs> I have a question. So yeah. what, out, of, out, out of these amazing, like, attributes that you have, what's your superpower? My superpower? I think my superpower, you know... I don't know how to I'll tell you what it is without saying a word because I don't know what that would be. But every time I get into a taxi, an Uber, I see someone who's on the streets or anywhere. I have this thing where I'll talk to someone. So if somebody picks me up and I have a 10 minute car ride by the end of those 10 minutes, I know the entire person's life. They tell me their struggles. They tell me what's going on with their family. I give them a little bit of advice based on my experiences. And every time I get dropped off, they're like, thank you so much. You just made my day. I really love speaking with you. But they still I take the money, kind of, don't they? They still take the money. I know, right? That's annoying. <laughs> but I think <laughs> I have this tendency of just bringing, uh, letting pe- people are very open with me. And I think it's because, again, it comes from really me being genuinely interested in what they're going through and trying to make them feel better. I love doing that. It's weird, but I love it. So I think that my superpower is allowing people to be themselves and open up and not be afraid of saying different things to me that maybe they can't talk to other people about. I would say that that's my superpower. So like, it's sort of like comfortability, like you're, you're, yeah. everybody feels comfortable with you. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. 
Like you're, you, you don't have that, that. Like you never sound like you're condescending or annoying. You're, no, you're always I don't judge open at all. And, and no, not no. judgeful. And yeah. And so okay, that's a really good energy. That's that's like an energy superpower, right? That's an energy superpower. It goes back to my yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> and, and what would be your kryptonite? Uh, so that would be my bad thing, right? Yeah. So I'm a Gemini. <laughs> Which right. means I have a lot of personalities at times. So I would say, and I'm, so I don't know, I'm all about signs also, but I'm Gemini with Leo. So I have, I can, I can go from a sunny day to like a thunderstorm in a minute. And then the next minute, forget that it all happened. Do you think mm-hmm. that's also, because uh, you're very adaptive, right? You have, you can very get adaptive. along with everybody, right? So maybe that yeah. has to do with yeah. also with your good attribute that you get along with everybody, that you have a lot of characters. True, true, true. But I, I can be very dramatic. I think because I have okay. so many pers- Yeah, because I, right. I, I, I kind of, my life is like a movie. I can right. just treat it like, you know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I de- I definitely yeah. Know what I mean. We've been asking you questions and hearing part of the movies, right? So we have a few really good scenes there. Yeah. <laughs> like the Bars and Noble one. Yeah, yeah. Sure. That's true. And so that's yeah. the kryptonite, so that- I see. And, uh, yeah. and what would you advise? You know, there's a lot of people that I think they have, like, like you, you have a really great charisma. Like you, you're Thank very you. charismatic. Well, like what would you advise Thank people you. who are charismatic that are still frustrated? You know, they want to be entrepreneurs. They never like school. They don't like to be told what to do, but they don't know what to do. You know, they're in that stage right now. Yeah. I think that was the, that was your, your um, magic moment. Yeah. Like that was the, yeah. the moment that, was that everything moment. happened. Yeah. When you said no to that job, that was like that yeah. moment. So what would you say to those people? I would say, Go after what you want. Don't be afraid. Don't listen to outside voices. Even if it's your mom, your dad, I don't care how close you are. People that are afraid for you because they're not as spontaneous and doing what they want to do are always going to pull you back. Not because they don't believe in you. They might say they don't believe in you, but it's really because they're afraid of you getting hurt or not or failing. So I would say like shut everybody off and follow what you want to do. Don't be afraid of like the unknown. And the last thing is you're going to pass through a lot of hurdles and struggles. Like when I started, when I said no to the job and I started doing my own thing, I literally ate Velveeta cheese sandwiches for three months for breakfast, lunch, and dinner because this Velveeta cheese is so cheap and comes like 200 in a pack. And I lived in like a 250 square foot studio in the project in New York. It was really a struggle. And but at the same time, I knew this is what I want to do. And my mom was like, you're crazy. Everybody said I was crazy. But I was like, I'm going to just continue and just do it. Um, and so I think like just shut off the outside voices. Have your circle that's your friends and family. But choose one or two people that you know will always have your back. Call it your life cheerleaders. Be fearless and know that you're going to struggle. But if you really believe in what you're doing, it's going to pass. And be very persistent. Those would be the things, and I'm telling you exactly what I did. So these are why these are my advices. But I would say that those would be those would be them. I love it. And what I also love is that you're saying things that could so easily sound a cliche, but I yeah. um, I believe you a hundred percent. Oh, thank so you. No, like but it's true. To me. That's the one thing I was. Tell, I was, I was gonna... have those two cheerleaders. Uh, life cheerleaders, which I like that brand, by the way. I never heard that right? combination. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I, 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 it's not cliche. I, it's, it's hard, right? Because a lot of people say that, but I genuinely think that that's really good advice. Uh, it's really Thank hard you. to to you know to, to do, <laughs> you know. But they're taking those chances and everything that you did, but it's very inspiring, and I thank you so much. Yeah, um, wow! And thank you guys so much. Oh, yeah, that was great, and and um, um, I'm definitely going to like ping you a few times to get a few fashion <laughs> tip, you know, techy <laughs> stuff happening on my on my wearables. That uh, sounds awesome, and I love talking to you guys, and I love what you guys are doing, and I love things like this where, like, you know just talks to people and hopefully inspires like one that's listening. That's already like an amazing reach. I'm sure there's many more with your podcast, but you guys did an amazing job of just making me feel comfortable. So you kind of have that same knack of making the person open because I was fully transparent on this. And um, yeah, so thank you guys so much. And thank you for lying. That is amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a good one. We're hoping to speak to you again when the book comes published. I would love to send you guys a copy. Send me on a 
DM like your address. I would love to send you a copy of the book. Done. Sure Done. thing. Done. Sure thing. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Real life. Superpowers.